Hello and welcome to How to Sell a Ton of Books in Five Simple Steps from the Skipjack Publishing Online School, which is newly launched. I'm Pamela Fagan Hutchins, and while you can hear me in real time, it's actually 45 seconds after my time. So I wanted to let you guys know that in case you are posting questions or things through chat, that there's um, a significant delay between uh, when you are seeing it and I'm saying it and when you're typing it versus when I see it. So I'm going to go through some housekeeping stuff first because I anticipate that there's going to be a fair number of the over 100 people that have signed up for this free webinar that are logging on after 12 o'clock, but we'll only give them about five minutes, you guys. Um, so for starters, if you have signed into the chat, which I apologize, is a different system than Teachable. In order to do a webinar free without me having to pay an enormous fee, we had to go with a service that requires a separate login for the chat. And I do apologize for that. Um, but if you will click to chat, it'll lead you through the login process. And then you're welcome to let me know who you are, where you're from, if you're published or not, um, how you're published, and anything else you want to say. You're welcome to leave questions as we go over in the chat too. Because I'm going to be concentrating really hard, this is my very first um, webinar to ever do, and there's a lot of moving parts technology-wise that challenge me. <laughs> um, I'll probably save up the questions in chat and when I get to the end of the content in the webinar I'll scroll back up and take them in order and for those of you that want to stick around after the webinar and hear the Q&A you are more than welcome to stick around with me and when we're all done we'll bid each other a, a lovely Thursday and be on our way or whatever day of the week it is for those of you that are tuning into the replay. So a little bit first about this system. If it freezes up on you, just hit refresh. The only downside is going to be that I think it makes you sit through a ridiculous ad again like any other free service on the internet, but then it'll pop back to where we are. Also, you're going to have missed a few seconds, but don't let it bother you because there's a free replay that's going to be available for at least two weeks, 24-7. You'll get an email in about 24 hours with a link to that free replay, and you'll be able to go back and see whatever it is that you missed or watch it over and over and over again if that's your kind of thing. Um, so this is our first um, foray into online training. I am, as I said, I'm an author. You probably already knew that. Um, <laughs> but I'm published by Skipjack Publishing, which um, is a small independent publisher with about six or seven authors now, mostly mystery, thriller, and suspense. And uh, I do a lot of workshops, retreats, um, manuscript critiques, stuff like that on behalf of Skipjack. And so it seemed a natural evolution to put the content that I was doing live at conferences into an online format. And so this free webinar is the first um, iteration of that online content. We will be putting out a new course about every two weeks or as fast as I can make myself sit down in front of a camera and be videoed doing the different segments of the class. Um, my area where I write is mostly romantic mystery. But don't let that put you off if you're thinking, how can a romantic mystery writer teach me, who writes, whatever it is you write, how to sell books? I have worked with authors in every conceivable genre. Um, and I also write narrative nonfiction and how-to. Um, just, you can't, um, you just barely can imagine how many different people come at me with questions and I help them find readers um, with genres that I would I don't even read, much less do I write. So stay with me. I'm probably going to be able to help you. Um, for those of you that are just tuning in, you're probably seeing over in the comments that people are introducing themselves. And please also know that you can hit refresh if your video freezes at any time. I have a checklist because, as I said, I'm technolo technologically challenged, and this is my first time to do this. 
and there was a hundred different <laughs> moving parts. So excuse me if I look down occasionally. I'm making sure I don't mess up um, the gift of your one hour of time. So the uh, mysteries that I write are in a series. It's called What Doesn't Kill You. There are seven and counting. There's going to be an eighth one this fall. And there's been about 1.5 million downloads at this point. Um, I've quit my day job. Yay! I've quit my day job, which I think is why most people um, look to me and think maybe there's something I can learn from that woman's experience and the collective experience of the other authors that she works with, both within the publishing company that publishes them and also from Houston Writers Guild, um, from Sisters in Crime, from Romance Writers of America, from Wyoming Writers, all the different writing groups that I'm part of. The content today is going to last about an hour. It's um, five after by my time, and I'll leave some time from for at the end to go over some of your questions. I do want to tell you, you're not going to have to look at my face this whole time, which is a bigger relief for me than you because I can actually see myself while I'm doing this and it's killing me. Um, we're going to mostly look at some slides that have content on them as soon as we get everybody signed in. And it looks like we're starting to have some introductions. Hello, Kim from Amarillo. Colleen. Oh, hi, Colleen from the Hollywood Sisters in Crime meeting. Colleen's name is... Um, Paisley Ray when she writes, and Carmen from Mexico. Welcome, everybody. I'm glad to have you guys here. The other thing I want to tell you about the content that we're going to go over is that I can't teach you everything you need to know in 45 minutes or even an hour. <laughs> I wish that I could because that would be the kind of magic formula that can make me a lot more rich than writing books well, but I can't. So I want you to think of it this way. There's a book that I wrote called What Kind of Loser Indie Publishes and How Can I Be One Too? It is the, uh, I update it once a year, but the static content behind um, what it is that I teach. Then there is the live workshops that I do. Those are hit and miss pieces. We're going to put together this comprehensive online school where you can take any or all pieces to put the whole picture together for yourself. But today what is going to happen is you're going to learn what I think are the five most important things for being able to sell a ton of books. And then from there, it's going to, in your mind, spark things that you need to know more about. And that's a good thing, knowing where your blind spots are so you can go out and put your glasses on and see is a, is a wonderful thing. So I'm going to check real quick and see how we're doing on people getting logged in. We're actually looking pretty darn good here. Every second there's more of you. So I am going to repeat that if this video freezes, just click refresh. If you have to step out, I'll never know. You will get the replay and all will be good. And now with no further ado, I'm going to switch it over to my slides and uh, I'll probably poke back on and you can see my face a little at the end, but otherwise you're done with me. All right, how to sell a ton of books in five simple steps. Of course, the steps are simple. The doing of the steps may be a little less as simple, uh, but that's all right. We're here to learn. As I mentioned a second ago, um, I wrote a book called What Kind of Loser Indie Publishes and How Can I Be One Too? And at the time I wrote it, my perspective was of being an independently published um, fiction writer and a traditionally published nonfiction writer, which makes me a hybrid, I guess. And uh, everything that I was learning, I was learning through the DIY model. Do it yourself. Do it myself. What I discovered over the last few years is that my friends that are traditionally published are having to learn that they're having to do the same things that I'm doing when it comes to finding their own readers and marketing and, and promotion elements because they're not J.K. Rowling and there's not this ginormous marketing and promotion budget and plan for their books. And so I've, I'm really finding that the indie in this title is a misnomer. This is really what you can learn from indies, whether you're indie or not, and how you can use that to find your readers and sell more books. 
the other thing that I find is a really common refrain besides the uh, you know, how, how will this help me? I'm not an indie when I'm talking to writers is that no matter whether a writer's indie or whether they're traditional or hybrid, that they all reach this wall where everything seems to be going against them. They've written the book, it's not selling, or maybe it was selling and it stopped selling and they want to get that ball rolling again. Well, if that's you, then you're in good company because I go to a lot of conferences around the country and speak at different conferences, and I hear this over and over and over. How do I sell more books? Um, hi to Martine Lewis, who's just jumped in on the chat. The five steps that I think of are the five most important things in selling a ton of books sounds simple, but it's always in the execution, if you will, that um, things become challenging. So today we're going to go over the concepts, and the concepts themselves are not hard. If and when you have questions as you go through the execution, I encourage you to be part of writers groups where you can turn to other people and learn from what's going well for them and, and what's not, and to include me in your network. And if you have questions, feel free to send them to me. I'll let you know if they are too time consuming for me to deal with on just a handshake basis and, and we need a consulting arrangement, but most of the time if they're short, I'll just give you a, a quick answer and help you out. So step one in my five simple steps is no runny buggy ketchup. If you have been to one of my live classes before, you've heard this phrase. If you haven't, you're thinking that I have lost my ever-loving mind. But here's what I'm talking about. When it comes to, let's use ketchup as our example here since we're starting. When it comes to ketchup, there are certain standards that when we go into a store and we decide we're going to buy a bottle of ketchup, there are standards for what we think of as quality. And we expect when we pick up that bottle off the shelf that it's going to meet certain minimum standards. And those standards are set, if you will, by the name brands within that market. So if we're talking ketchup, maybe that's a Heinz. And those standards have everything to do with the product. Color, consistency and texture, taste, smell, and I swear this is a thing, bug parts per million. Um, I had a friend that used to work <laughs> in, in a manufacturing facility and that just appalled me. But um, it, where you can buy it is also part of the standard packaging and delivery options. So all of this makes up the package of the name brand ketchup. And if you're coming in with any other ketchup, an off-brand ketchup, a specialty ketchup, a generic ketchup, then people are going to expect when they pick up your bottle of ketchup that it meets what the minimum standards are that they've come to expect. So what does ketchup have to do with books? In publishing, when a reader picks up a book off the virtual or the actual shelf, they also have come to think that there are certain standards that your book will meet. And those standards are set by the name brand in publishing, which is primarily the big five within the American Association of Publishers. Big pub, traditional publishing, if you will. So those include things like the cover, the content, the editing, the copy, where it's sold and in what formats. So think with me for just a second about the standard that's set for a cover, for instance, in traditional publishing. It is what sells the book. You, we hope that that's not the case, but uh, everyone seems to judge a book by its cover if they get the chance to see it and it hasn't been recommended to them as something that they should read despite the cover. So the cover is your reader's first entree to what your book has in it, and it needs to sell the name of the book, it needs to sell the title, it needs to evoke a response that causes someone to want to read it, and it needs to be, since so incredibly much of the commerce of books these days is online, it needs to sell all of that in a 200 by 300 image or smaller, a thumbnail. And the best place to 
see what it is for your type of book. Remember, I write romantic mysteries and, and nonfiction, but maybe you write fantasy or maybe you write um, short stories or, or something else. Look at the bestsellers in the category for your type of book on Amazon, and you can see what it is in terms of a cover that meets the standard and that people are buying. Because, of course, if you want to sell a ton of books, you hope that means people are buying. We'll look at some examples in a second. You also want to make sure that your content is rock solid, meaning that it is, if it's nonfiction, that it's accurate, that if it is uh, fiction, that it is the a wonderful story arc with great characters and a solid plot and tension that rises and builds with every chapter. All the things that make a good book. You also need to make sure that your editing is as near to error free as possible. Your copy, uh, meaning the back of the book or the sales information that's on, let's stick with Amazon since they're the the big gorilla in the room as far as where sales occur, that, that that copy that appears on the sales page is in the voice that you wrote the book in, that it is emotionally compelling because people usually buy books because uh, they are tipped over the point of wanting to buy them by some irrational emotion. We're very rarely sold on a book by facts unless we're looking for a particular how-to and even then it helps if something about it appeals to it solving our problems, which is an emotional response, as opposed to uh, laying out the solution for us. And that that copy must be edited, and preferably by, preferably by the same copy editor that did your book. That your products are sold where readers expect to buy them because the name brands are sold there as well. And this means that unless you're selling millions of products on your own website already, that you're, you're better off making sure that you are at least also available on the established sales sites. I would go so far as to say that, that unless you're that already that name brand that's selling millions on your own website that you probably don't even want to compete with the um, different established sales sites who already have their own volume traffic that are coming to them to buy books. And in what formats it's sold. This is another thing that is established by um, the name brand, if you will, ebook, print, audio translations, etc. And before before we get into resistance mode, some of us hear about I only like print books or I don't want to spend money on print. I only want to do ebook. Remember that different people read in all different formats, and that even kids. So we're talking. Uh, middle grade and younger books. Even kids are learning on electronics in elementary school now, and they're reading ebooks on their phones at that age. So, very early on, um, being able to satisfy the different formats that your reader wants your book in will be important. So, let's look at an example of a cover. I'm going to pick on myself. I wrote a book. This is one of the very first books I wrote, and it's a combination of fiction and nonfiction. And the cover on the left is the one I originally had done. It's muddy. It's hard to see what it is um, that's, pic uh, that's in the picture, especially if you get it down to thumbnail, because there's images in front of images in front of images. And in general, it looked like a cartoon kid's book, and it's not. It's for adults. The image on the right, whether you love it, whether it, you, it would be the um, cover you would pick or not, simplified. One image, no images over images, so no, no muddying up of your cover, especially in thumbnail, with the name of the book and the name of the author very clear and consistent. This made a humongous amount of difference for me with this book. So the standard for covers I wasn't meeting with the original cover of this book. We went back to the drawing board and came up with something that at least came a lot closer to meeting the standard. We think it meets the standard. I pulled up the bestsellers from literary fiction anthologies of short stories just to give you an idea of how this would look if you were checking out book covers on Amazon to see how yours compared with the bestsellers. And with one exception on this page, the common elements to me are that you can clearly read, even in thumbnail, the name of the author and the name of the book. Um, 
the third book down, the Richard Brodigan book, I cannot clearly read the title, although what he does have going for him there is an image that is clear and evokes an emotional response even in thumbnail. And the other common element is that second thing I mentioned. It's that the images are clean and crisp. There's not thing in front of thing in front of thing. And this is a common mistake I see. The, the image is too complicated for the cover. So these are the five bestsellers in this category. And if I wrote these types of books, it would be what I'd be comparing my cover to to see if I met the standard. And I'll show you some more examples later. I had um, an author contact me once who had written a nonfiction book and it got a scathing one review talking about the editing and he said to me, don't they know how long and hard I've worked on this book? I've done all I'm going to do. And of course the fallacy there, and the they being the readers, the fallacy there is that the readers care how long and hard you work on something. They only care whether or not you meet the standards that they rightly have come to expect when they spend their time and to a lesser extent their money consuming your book instead of all the other things in the world they could have done with that time. So if you don't meet the standards then you are runny buggy ketchup or whatever the literary equivalent of that is and what I find is is that this is the first and most important element as to whether or not you're going to get a ton of sales or any sales at all. If you are the runny buggy ketchup of books, then that equals bad sales, right? And bad sales equals any time or money I've invested is at a loss here. And in fact, there's this weird uh, paradox. I found that the more people invest on the front end in books, the more likely they are to recoup that investment later. And I think of the expression, go slow to go fast. Um, maybe you didn't grow up hearing this, but I did. It means be careful. It means be sure that what you have is what you want to have out there before you put it out there, before you ruin your authorly reputation and thus your future sales for other books forever by a runny buggy catch-up book. I hear too often, I can only afford one element of what you're suggesting I do, Pamela, so I'm just going to have to put it out there anyway. And what I would encourage instead is go slow to go fast there. If that means you have to delay publication in order to be able to find a way to barter or to raise the money for a particular element that you need to invest in for your book, you're going to be better off later having waited than having put it out there and potentially put readers off that may never come back to what it is you're selling. Step two. I'm going to take a quick peek and see how we're doing over here on the webinar. Hi, M. Uh, a pen name Rebecca Fiore. <laughs> and uh, no other hands up. All right, so going back to my slides here. Step two is to focus on what I call the five R's. So again, Pamela is speaking a weird language. What are the five R's? Well, I'll tell you in a second, but first I'll tell you what I've never seen work to sell a ton of books ever, and that is authors that directly ask people to buy their book. But they, when they say it, when they shout it, when they type it, when they whisper it on Facebook, Twitter, Goodreads, or in person, it doesn't work. People don't buy books because the author told them to. In fact, that's considered to be a little pushy, a little crass, and drives people away. People buy books for other reasons. They buy books, these people that are your readers, because of the five R's. Other readers, their reviews, their ratings, their recommendations, and the rankings that that results in, which give you greater visibility and thus greater sales, in the different sales platforms. So when it comes to readers, your particular book may be read by a child or it may be read by a 20-year-old man, but statistics tell us that women over 40 buy 75% of the books purchased in all formats. So when I think of readers, I want you to also think of the person who acquires that book, which may look different from who your end reader is, and you need to be able to appeal to the person who's going to procure the book for the reader. And you're hoping that you have lots of readers leaving wonderful reviews, which 
have attached to them fantastic ratings and that they're leaving recommendations. Now the reviews themselves are recommendations but recommendations can also be a posting on your website or Facebook or an email they send to friends or telling the people at their book club about their book. Whatever it is that it might be. I also want to encourage you to think that a reader is not the same thing as a buyer or even a procurer, that um, sometimes your early readers are just those people you can convince to commit the time it takes to read your book when you are an unknown, when you are not a proven commodity that has proven to everyone that you meet the standards of good ketchup, right? So you're thinking of readers and I'm also encouraging you to think beyond these readers finding you in bookstores because only 1% of the books published each year end up on actual book sh um, shelves unless they're put there by consignment which is a, a lot of work by the author and they're returnable if they are um, direct sale. So that's a whole nother training class is uh, bookstores and how to get in them, you know, etc. But just know that 99% of us in any given year that publish a book aren't going to end up on the shelves of an actual bookstore. So you, when you're thinking of readers and you're thinking of where they find you, you need to think of where you do have access to them. And if you don't have access to them in a real bookstore, where do you have access to them? Online or at your events. Um, and, and that's about, or anywhere else you can think of, but that's about it. To find your readers also, you have to figure out what you write and who reads it and why they read it. And, and in fact, you have to sometimes get over your own perceptions here. I'm going to give an example um, relating to me again. When I first started writing, I thought I wrote women's fiction. Then uh, after um, dealing with some agents for a while, before I decided to go indie published, I had three different novels out on full with three different agents and I was talking with each of them about my books. and. One of them was saying, you know, it's a dead body, it's a mystery. Okay, fine, I write mysteries. Well, then when it really came time for people to discover my books, it turned out that what they thought I wrote was romantic mysteries. And that may change your cover, that may change your copy that you have on the back of the book or on the sales site, but your readers are right. Whoever's reacting to your book and reading it because it fits what it is they like to read, they're going to be the expert that you should listen to. How do you find readers? Well, again, this is going to be the subject of one of the full-length courses that we put out on the Skipjack online um, uh, training school. But to find those initial readers, the ones that are going to help you with the five R's, you have to remember that you're not a name brand. They're not going to be going into Barnes & Noble and buying your book off the best sellers table or shelf. Uh, and they're not even sure if you meet the standards of good ketchup, right? So you're going to need to find a way to get it in the hands of people who take a chance on you. You would think that the people most likely to take a chance off on you would be your inner circle and the people closest in to you. That's unfortunately not been my experience. My experience has been that the closest in are the last to adopt because they still see you as whatever it was that you were before or maybe still are in the rest of your time and being a reader is a rare and special thing they don't really see you as that rare and special thing yet so you need to get strangers to have a reason to take a chance on you and you need to remember that reviewers like book bloggers or reviewers for media etc expect to get your book free so will those strangers who are wanting to take uh, who you're wanting to take a chance on you and then you will work your way up through book influencers and hopefully eventually to book buyers if you're wanting to give books away in the hope of getting readers who will take that chance on you and help you with the five R's help you get the reviews ratings and recommendations that lead to rankings uh, bookfunnel.com makes it super easy. I'm not going to spend much time on this, but I do want to show you what it looks like. This is the book dashboard of my book funnel account. And what you do is you uh, enter the information for a book into book funnel and generate a link that you can then give to whoever you want to have the book for free. The benefit to you is that you don't have a large 
ebook file that's getting hung up in spam or too big for email services, and you don't have people that are contacting you asking you to tell them how to load it onto their device or um, uh, you know asking for a different format. All of that is administered by BookFunnel for a nominal fee. So that's my money tip when it comes to giving away books. So step three. A follow-up to step one, which is no runny buggy catch-up, and step two, which is focus on the five R's. Step three is write more. And you didn't want to hear this step because you worked years to write that first book. Maybe you don't even feel like you have another book in you. And yet, if you really want to sell a lot of books, then you need more than one book. The odds are against making a ton of money on one book. That bears repeating. The odds are against making a ton of money on one book. And if your goal is to sell a ton of books, then that should be a wake-up call. And in fact, you probably wouldn't be at this webinar devoting your time if you weren't interested in selling a ton of books. You also wouldn't be at this webinar if you're a brand name. <laughs> You're not a brand name, and I'm sorry if that stings. Maybe you will be someday. Maybe I will be someday, but I'm not. And if you're not a brand name, then it's going to take more than one book. For one thing, that first book that you put out, I think of as the book that helps you generate the five R's. You let it do most of the work in helping you find those readers, ratings, reviews, recommendations, and rankings. Conventional wisdom, um, based upon the stats in the industry and the, the, the big indie authors that have provided information about their um, trajectories, is that you need about four to six complementary books before monetization really takes place. And let me tell you my story here because I, it fits this exactly, and I, and I felt some resistance to this when I first heard it. When I first put out my nonfiction books, they, they were completely different from each other. They were not complementary. And then I put out my novels, which were not complementary to the nonfiction books. But when I got to my, it, for me it was my third novel, but with the fourth I really started to make money. But with the third novel is where I had my breakthrough. And suddenly it all started to make sense and all that resistance I, I had felt was just a sign that I'd been bumping up against that place where I had a lot to learn. If you don't have more to say then and you're thinking, well Pamela I can't ever do this, I've written my book, then I'd take a step back and I'd say, can you break the book that you have up into multiple pieces, into shorter books and create more than one asset out of it instead of just one? Because you do need some way when you're not a name brand to break in and, and to, to build up these five R's. Um, when you're thinking of playing the odds, of course you want more than one book, um, you should also know that short stories and even uh, and poetry and even anthologies of the same generally generate less money than do full-length works. People seem to be hungering for full-length works. Does that mean you can't sell more books? Absolutely not. You can certainly sell a lot more than you're selling. And you may have a ceiling that you're going to reach before a full-length writer um, you know, will reach their ceiling. Another way to help yourself with the odds is if you've written, let's say you've written a novel, and you've decided you don't want to make that your sacrificial lamb for the five R's, write a prequel novella. They make a great way to um, have something to give away that you're, you're less loath to do so with. And they're also a great way to help you build your email signups, which are, if you will, people that sign up for your email newsletter. They are your, and I'm using big air quotes here, freedom from the vagaries of the big sales platforms to the extent that you can communicate directly with your readers, you don't have to depend on Amazon to do that communicating for you. Um, and you, you uh, can use anything that you want to give away to encourage those kinds of signups, but prequel novellas are a great way, or short stories are a great way to do it. Uh, or if you're doing nonfiction, short works that cover a micro topic of what you cover within the book. 
it's not just me that says this. Uh, readers say this too. When I love a character or author, I want more right then. If I can't find more, I move on. So when you think about buying patterns and you think about how easy online purchasing makes it for someone to run the table of an author's books, if someone discovers you and you only have one thing to sell them, then they're going to move on to somebody else and then they may or may not remember to come back to you later. If you've got more than one thing to sell them, then Eureka, now you have the opportunity for exponential sales off that one reader that you've converted to a reader of your work. Here is a screenshot of Amazon's top, well this is just the top three writers, the whole page was the top 20, but the top three authors on Amazon, meaning these are the ones that they sell the most books of. Notice that not a single one of them sells only one book. <laughs> so um, that should be a wake-up call. And I would also point out here to take a look at their covers. And you can see, again, um, easy-to-read author names, especially with James Patterson, who used to be a publisher. So he's pretty savvy at this game. And easy-to-read titles and images that aren't muddied by a lot of background. All right, step four. You have made sure that your book is not runny buggy ketchup. You have made sure that you were pursuing the five R's instead of pursuing buyers because the five R's will lead to buyers. And you have um, you've also uh, started writing more. Sorry about that. Had a brain freeze. You've started writing more because you know that you want um, readers to be able to buy more than one literary asset from you. Now you want to price it in. How and why? Well, first of all, why? You are not a name brand. Is there an echo in here? Echo, echo. Yes, there is. You aren't a name brand or you wouldn't be at this webinar. So let's think about pricing. When you have a print book, honestly, there's very little sensitivity as to are you traditional or are you indie or are you both or are you a bestseller or are you not? Um, so you basically price it at uh, about the same level as you're seeing the other types of paperbacks or hardbacks priced for online and that sweet spot's between 10 to $20. With audio, if you do an audio book, then you don't have any control at all through um, audiobook creation exchange, which is how uh, these days most people that aren't big names are doing their audio, and they set the price for you. The only place you're going to have significant control and competitive advantage as a non-name brand is with an ebook. And I'll tell you, I've spent a lot of time and money pursuing print. And I believe in print. A print book is a business card that lives on. They're great in libraries. I'm in bookstores. I sell print books at events, but I make nearly 95% of my income off ebooks. And I highly encourage you, if you want to take a look at how indie authors are doing in print, audio, and ebook compared to traditional authors, to look at the uh, link I have in the middle of the page here, authorearnings.com, where uh, Hugh Howie and his, quote, a data guy, comb the different sales sites for data and put together reports that show us what's really selling and what people are really making. So with ebooks that are not name brand, the normal pricing sensitivity is somewhere between $299, $499, a little higher on the up end for people that are becoming name brands, and lower on the bottom end for specials or series leads or um, things where you're trying to encourage volume. You may decide you want to do Kindle Unlimited and if that doesn't make sense to you that's that would be the subject of a whole different webinar how to choose where you're selling your book and and uh, the strategies around that but if you are doing Kindle Unlimited which is the exclusive Amazon ebook um, and and then uh, offered to its subscribers like a Netflix for books so Kindle Unlimited becomes a Netflix uh, of books for the readers. You as an author give an exclusive to Amazon and opt-in. 
you don't have a choice um, there over what people pay you either. Amazon sets a fund and then based upon how many people read how many of the Amazon designated pages in your book, you get paid. So, you know, there's, there's no control. You might do well there, you might not. The other thing, and I'll talk about this more in a moment, is you could choose for your pricing to go discount or perma-free, but let's save that for another slide and just focus instead on that the pricing sensitivity for an indie published ebook or a non name brand ebook is lower than a brand name, period. If you do not price it lower than the brand names do, then you're missing the boat as far as your competitive advantage. How do you convince a reader to take a chance on a non name brand unless you say, I know that you don't know who I am, so here, try me. Try me at a, a slightly better price and you'll love me. If you want some, you're, there's a really good yearly pricing advice blog that's put out by Mark Coker of Smashwords. His 2016 um, book publishing predictions are at the link you see there on the screen. Also, if you write a series, whether it's a fiction or a nonfiction series, it gives you the opportunity to do pricing funnels within this price sensitivity for non name brand ebooks, where you start at a free or 99 cent book and work your way up to a more and more expensive book through the series. And to show you an example of what that looks like, I'll, I'll show you mine in a second. But first, I want to leave you with this thought because many of you are thinking, I am worth more than that. My book is worth more than that. I worked harder than that. It's art that's giving it away, etc. And some really smart woman, uh, Pamela Freakin Hutchins, or at least that's what her editor calls her, says this to you. This is a business. Once you start selling your art for money, whether through, uh, whether directly through the sales platforms or with an agent and a publisher, you're in the business of publishing. So you have to either get over it or get out of it. If you want to make money, you get over it. And there is a tremendous incentive for the non-name brands to price in. Um, Pricing it right leads to the five R's where the readers can take a chance. Promoters love free and discount books. And when I mean, say promoters, I mean the online websites with subscribers that promote ebooks that are discounted or free. Now, they curate these often, and so they're looking to see if you meet the five R's before they pick you, but they're also looking to see that you offer it either free, permanently or temporarily, or at a discount. And even at a discount, if you can generate volume, you can make some money. One of our authors um, put their book on for 99 cents in January, went up to number 46 overall on Amazon, and brought in $5,000 in four days. So 99 cents helped that author, didn't hurt that author, and generated a lot of the five R's. Then the better you do at the five R's, the more you raise your price. So looking at my series for a moment here, um, or at least the first three books in it. Saving Grace is the first one, and it is available for 99 cents. That's that book funneling idea. Start with the cheaper, and then the second book in the series is 3.99. The third book is 4.99. So Leaving Annalise is second. Finding Harmony is third. Now, I used to price these lower, and I made not a whole lot less money. I got to say, I priced them at free. $2.99 and $2.99. And at those prices, I made nearly the same money um, that I do now. So raising your price doesn't always mean you're going to make more. So step five is paying it forward. We've uh, got to be thinking about how we enlist other people to help us if we want our books to sell or we are never going to get there when we're not a name brand. So let's think about that for a second. If you picture yourself having a moment like this one, the woman with the really open mouth in the middle there that looks extraordinarily happy is me, and that's in uh, Orange County at a Barnes & Noble book signing in 2013. So you look at that picture and you think, wow, Pamela has it all. She's made it. She's in Barnes & Noble. Look at her books. Look at all those people. The reason those women are there is I gave a free speech to them at their women's group before we went to that event, and they all came and followed me. So, if you will, paying it forward in that circumstance led to that incredibly wonderful moment where my dreams are coming true. So, how do you build support? You give it first. How can an author do that? You can be a reviewer, a promoter for others, a critiquer, an encourager, 
a content provider for websites uh, or magazines. You can be an event attender. Things that will in turn make people want to read, review, rate, recommend your books. Another th big part of it, I find this to be enormously successful, is to speak publicly at whatever venues would allow you to get in front of your readers, especially if you're nonfiction. If you're nonfiction, you are selling your expertise as much as anything, and you need to get in front of those groups that need your book or want your book and sell your expertise and then build those relationships and sell those books there. And with children's books, speaking in the schools, it just it just can't be duplicated as far as a marketing um, device. You want to be giving value in exchange for what you want, in other words. So you go out and you speak, um, and, in, and people in return buy your books. And they do at events. They buy your books. Another thing that you can do to give value in exchange for what you want, like social media followers or blog and email list subscribers, is you can give them um, what you've written. So for instance, Skipjack Publishing gives away a um, book launch marketing plan in exchange for subscribership. I give away a free book, one of my books for subscribership. But building that support is everything. And you can also build support with other authors. Now, this is a busy slide, and we're going to kind of look at it in a um, clockwise format. The top image, Patricia McLean's sign-off in my book, is a co-Facebook ad with another author. So we are reciprocating each other with each other. We're trying to share our readers with each other to help each other build more readers. To the right, Women of Mystery. This is a couple of years old now, but it's a wonderful group of mystery writers that um, in Houston would hold events together and thus share readers with each other. And bottom, the text on the screen, that's actually an image. It comes from the back of a um, Jana De Leon book. And she is, at the end of her book, recommending, if you liked her book, you'd like Rose Gardner uh, series by Denise Grover Swank. Truly genius. Two really, really big time selling romantic mystery authors cross promoting each other. So I mentioned this earlier. Learning is what happens when we break through our resistance. You probably felt resistance at some point during this 45 minutes of me yattering on about something I've said, whether it's that I feel like you need to be in ebooks no matter what, whether it's that I think you need to slow down and wait till you can afford the different elements that keep you from being runny buggy ketchup, or whatever it is that you may be in resistance to. I've been there as well. I know what that feels like and I really encourage you that that feeling you have when your gut gets tight and you think I don't want to do that is usually what you get right before you have some big breakthrough. So to wrap it up and that by the way that lovely image is my bookmobile. <laughs> That's our uh, rolling tax write-off there the one we take to all our book events. I want you to focus on if you want to sell a ton of books that your book is not runny buggy ketchup, that you're focusing on the five R's instead of sales because they will be what leads to sales. And if you focus on sales instead, you'll just drive people away. I want you to focus on writing more because having more to author offer will lead to more sales of whatever you wrote in the first place. I want you to price it in. I want you to get over thinking that you're so dang special because you wouldn't be trying to sell more books listening to this webinar if you had it all figured out. And I'm telling you folks, pricing it in to the non-brand section can lead to becoming a brand and getting out of that section. And finally, paying it forward so that you're getting the help that you need in selling books. The last thing I'll say about that is that every time that I have made a commitment to do something to help other people, sometimes add a step change that I felt like was going to drown me, has resulted in a bigger response of people helping me than I could fathom and, then, and, and more than equaled what I was putting into it. So even as you're paying it forward, know that a sincere pay it forward gets a sincere support back. I mentioned earlier we're rolling out a whole online um, a series of courses and curricula on writing, publishing, and promotion at the link on the screen. And uh, gosh, I hoped that it said this. In fact, watch me type here. You, if you enter this 
uh, take 10 into the uh, prompt for discounts or coupons when you sign up for one of our classes, you're going to get $10 off, which is pretty cool. Our first course was rolled out yesterday, and it's on um, how to get reviews in 10 surefire ways. So your take 10 could bring the price of that down to $19 for you. We'll put out a course about every two weeks. And also, please feel feel free to go get a copy of my book, What Kind of Loser Indie Publishes and How Can I Be One Too. You can get freebies though as well. You can get that six month book launch um, plan from Skipjack by subscribing to their blog or you can get my um, free book by signing up for mine. So now you're back to my mug here. Um, I'm going to now go into the piece of this webinar where I can see if you, any of you have any questions. And let's see, how do I compare Book Funnel to NetGalley and pros and cons? This is a question from Rodney Walther. Um, Rodney, what Book Funnel does is gives you the ability at a very cheap price to have a link that you can provide to the reviewers that you locate and send to them so that they can download your book free without you having to administer the process. NetGalley, at a much higher price, actually has reviewers there that also can get your book easily and without you having to administer it, but may directly then choose to review your book. Sometimes these reviewers are big time reviewers and I'd encourage you for a lot more on reviews. The review class I just did and put out um, yesterday really gets into what kinds of reviews sell books and what kinds don't. Um, but the pros of NetGalley are access to reviewers with the price you pay. The con is the price. The pro of BookFunnel is the price and the ease of administration. The con is you still got to find your own reviewers. And that was a great question. I am going to keep watching the comments to see if there are any more questions. And in the meantime, any of you that need to sign off, then... Thank you for being here for the first free webinar, and I hope that you are tremendously successful in um, all that you do in publishing, and especially that you don't publish runny buggy ketchup, <laughs> and that you remember that phrase, which I find that people often do after I've talked to them. Uh, another question from Rodney. For me, success seems all about the Amazon algorithms. Hallelujah, yes. What are the keys to grabbing the attention of the algorithms, number of early reviews, how many, top, whatever, bestseller list, changing keywords? Um, so for those of you that are a little bit advanced here, the Amazon algorithms determine uh, where you appear in bestseller ranks, and they also determine how much promotion Amazon is going to do for you. So for instance, if you put out uh, a new book and put it up for pre-order, Amazon may send out an email and tell everyone under the universe about your free book, I mean, your new book, or they may it, put your book in a people also read um, at the bottom of someone else's page. Or I have people that send me emails every single day that says you might also like books by and they get emails from Amazon's. Well, what I've seen is that if you get about 25 reviews in the first six months, Amazon generally is going to start promoting you. But for me, I did not start seeing the significant promotion until, uh, until I had really hundreds of thousands of downloads. Now, keep in mind that part of those downloads were free books. And I've seen a step change recently, Rodney, in who I get recommended with. It used to be that I got recommended with books that I didn't necessarily know or, or even care if I was associated with. And now I'm being recommended with books that are the top sellers in my category, which rocks my world. Um, so if you then turn to look and see how many reviews do I have that when that's happened, well, it's 2300 on Saving Grace. It was about the 2000 level on Saving Grace where I started seeing um, it being promoted with the top sellers in my genre, and it was at about a, mm, over a million downloads overall that I started seeing that as well. But that's a big contrast from when you first start being promoted, which can be a much more um, modest uh, level of reviews and level of sales. And I'd equate it somewhat to the kinds of reviews you need to get to do a book bub, um, and the kind of of, of ranking they want to see before they'll they'll pick you. Um, and I would say that I'm seeing people 
have to get 50 to 60 um, reviews before Book Bubble touch them, unless there's a specialty reason they want that book. Um, how rapidly would you recommend releasing new books? This is from M, um, who writes as Rebecca. As fast as you have them ready. So, for instance, let's say you'd written a series that was already ready. When you promote one book in that series, it promotes all the books in that series, right? And if you think about it, the slower you, pr you release the books, the more promotion you're having to do for each book and the more promotion you're having to do to start the engine again when a new book comes out. So, you know, I've seen some people do the whole series at once or wait and do it just a couple of months apart. I try to release a book every six months, but I also, for my strategy, pick one book at a time that I'm going to focus on um, series lead or what I consider to be a series lead and throw all my promotion efforts into that book. So for instance, I'm releasing a book this fall that I'm, I think of as a soft release where I'm barely going to promote it because it's mid-series and instead I want to promote the funnel at the beginning of the series um, M. So for me, if I had all the books at once, I'd, I'd think doing them as quickly as possible would be good. From Paisley Ray, has pre-order on Amazon been successful for you? If so, how long do you place your book on pre-order before release? It's been tremendously successful for me. Um, the last two books I've put on pre-order with Amazon have been hot new releases within category on Amazon, and a lot of that had to do with um, the sales that were occurring prior to the day that it was released. Now, there has been a change in the last year in how, they, in how Amazon administers this. It used to be that if you put a book up on pre-order, then you might achieve rankings on the day that it was released that were stupendous because all of your sales would drop at once. Well, they don't do that anymore. Now they do it on the day that the sales occur. So your rankings will go up and down during the term of your pre-order and you won't necessarily have a big bump at the time that it's offered for pre-order. I utilize the whole 90-day Amazon pre-order period. Um, that's just me personally. We have discussed amongst ourselves at Skipjack, shortening that period to concentrate our efforts so that the sales are grouped more closely together and could result in higher rankings. Because obviously, 90 days, those sales can get pretty diluted. 30 days, they're more tightly clustered and they're going to result in higher rankings. So there may be a strategy change coming up with us in the future where I'll switch to 30 days on the pre-orders. The other reason I think pre-orders are so important is because Amazon, if you put a book up for pre-order and you meet whatever their algorithm says is the minimum for you to have um, promotion by Amazon, they'll send an announcement about your pre-order to your followers. The followers are the people that have clicked follow on your Amazon author page. And that announcement, number one, makes you look like a big-time rock star to all your friends. Um, but secondly, it also raises awareness when you think of that it takes multiple impressions oftentimes between when a person's going to click to buy and when they first saw your book cover or heard about your book. Maybe it's five for some people. Maybe it's ten for another. Hallelujah if it's one for some people. But that email counts as one impression. And then they turn around and also announce it again on the day of actual release. So you get two out of it. And in fact, Amazon lets you craft that second um, email yourself. What do you want to say to your followers since your book was released today? That's a super awesome thing. All right, so it is, on my clock anyway, 12.58. I bet it's um, actually of the hour to you guys. I want to thank you for sticking with me through my very first ever webinar online and through Skipjack Publishing's first foray into its online classes. And I encourage you to take advantage of your Take 10 coupon. And I'll be seeing you guys. Thanks a ton.